ist deshalb wichtig, weil sie ein Thema verspricht, was nicht so jeder auf dem Schirm hat. Aber eigentlich ist unser sicherheitspolitischer Kalender ja voll. Neue russische Politik, aggressive russische Politik im Osten, IS äh, im Süden, islamistischer Terror in unserem eigenen Land, Flüchtlinge in unserem eigenen Land, das ist mehr, als man eigentlich äh, in der Politik bewältigen kann. Trotzdem haben wir nicht den Luxus, uns auf diese beiden Dinge zu konzentrieren. Denn auch das sagt Botschaft der Eschinger, die Region Asien und Pazifik ist wichtig, und zwar wichtiger als mancher von uns meint. Nordkorea ist eines der Probleme, die angedeutet worden sind, aber es sind ganze vier Nuklearmächte in der Region, die sich alle in heftiger Abneigung äh, gegenüber verbunden sind, plus Russland, plus die USA, plus die Tatsache, dass diese Region ökonomisch wichtig ist, 80.000 Schiffe fahren durch die Malakka-Straße, plus die Tatsache, dass China äh, sich zu einer neuen Rolle aufschwingt. Insofern freue ich mich sehr, dass wir die Gelegenheit haben, über dieses Problem äh, zu sprechen. Und jetzt gehe ich auf Englisch über, to honor our uh, distinguished guests, we will do this discussion in English. Um, and we will not have long statements, but we will sort of uh, questions to the participants. And uh, I will briefly introduce them just with a, with a sentence. We will start with Dr. John Chipman, who is for many, many years the director, CEO of, one can say, the most important, the most prestigious security policy institute in the world, the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, uh, which is important also because it has a strong focus on Asia Pacific, and John himself is an expert on Asia Pacific, and they run a very important uh, conference every year, the Shangri-La conference, which is sort of the Munich security conference in the region. So let me start with John by asking, why is the, the region so important for us? I mean, it's far away, we have nice business there, why shall we care? I mean, North Korea, yes, but it's more probably a problem for the South Koreans and for others. Why is it so terribly vital for us to uh, not to forget, but even to focus more on this region? Well, let me answer that question, but do what politicians do, which is answer the question that I would like to answer first, and then answer the question. Uh, which is to say just a few words about what is this region with which Europe may engage more. Um, and the reason I think it's important to understand the region is that its uh, defense diplomatic history is so very different from the transatlantic one that for now 52 years we celebrate here with the Munich Security Conference. When the Munich Security Conference was established 52 years ago as a principally transatlantic discussion platform, uh, it brought together strategists and parliamentarians uh, to question the ministers of NATO about the policies that they were pursuing in respect of the East-West conflict. Uh, but that community was relatively easy to bring together, not just because of the genius of the founder, but also because there was an organization called NATO that existed that formalized the defense relations between uh, North America and Western Europe. Um, when I went to the Asia Pacific in 2001-2002, what I saw there uh, was a region where presidents met, finance ministers met, foreign ministers met, but defense ministers never met, occasionally bilaterally, but never in groups of more than two. So when we established the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2002, it was to create a defense institution against the background of a region that had no defense diplomacy of any kind at all. And it was a real discovery for the region that defense ministers could meet and not inspire controversy, but perhaps contain tensions. At the very first Shangri-La Dialogue in 2002, we were dealing with a nuclear crisis between India and Pakistan, and the American, British, and French defense ministers who were there deployed spent a great deal of time trying to calm down that enormous tension, which would have had an impact, I think, on the transatlantic relationship had it not been controlled. Four years later, in 2006, 
the Defense Ministers of ASEAN, having seen that they were able to meet under the auspices of the IISS at the Shangri-La Dialogue, created their own Defense Ministers meeting. And then a few years later, the ADMM Plus 8 was created. And what the Shangri-La Dialogue is trying to do is to stay ahead of the curve, not just in the amount of countries that are being represented, but in the quality of the debates that are taking place. And the reason I think the region is so important to Europe is, is twofold. First, Europeans are the number one advocates in the world for a rules-based order. And the rules-based order is under severe threat in the Asia Pacific because of the way in which uh, controversy over the South China and East China Sea is being prosecuted, because of the breaches of international law, as the foreign minister just stated, that North Korea has engaged in, and because of the proliferation of ungoverned spaces in which terrorist groups like ISIL uh, can prosper. So a European engagement in the Asia Pacific, I think, is very important. And it's a debt that Europeans, I think, owe to the Asia Pacific all the greater because of the disproportionate emphasis that Asians place on European security. The fact that a, a medium-sized country like Australia was able to take part in the ISAF uh, uh, operations in Afghanistan, that Korea did so as well as the foreign minister just reminded us. And remember, Korea was at one point the third largest troop contributing country to Iraq after the United States and the United Kingdom. Japan has taken a very principled stand on the crisis in Ukraine in its capacity as a G7 member, but in a way that perhaps didn't advance the very important relations that it still wishes to sustain uh, with uh, uh, Russia. So Asians have taken direct concern in European security. The most dramatic moment I thought was when Julie Bishop, uh, the foreign minister of Australia, occupying the presidency of the UN Security Council, led the United Nations Security Council uh, at that time of crisis uh, when the airliner was shot down uh, over Ukraine. So for Australia to take such a big role in the diplomacy of a European security problem, and for Europeans to be as diffident as they recently have been on the big issues of Asia Pacific security, I think is disproportionate. And so what I think um, uh, Europeans need to do, principally the big countries, the United Kingdom, France, and Germany, but also I think NATO and also the European Union, is to take a stand on the rules-based order uh, in uh, the Asia Pacific by assisting the United States and other regional countries in protecting freedom of navigation, by being very firm on the uh, breaches that North Korea has made, and by sharing intelligence and best practice on how to deal with the terrorist threats in ISIL. These are the three issues that Asians are most concerned with, and these are the three issues that Europeans need to engage in the Asians much more. Thank you very much. You managed to answer your question and mine, so that was very successful. Um, Dr. Ralf Rauchse, the Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Defense. And not only this, but for almost 18 years parliamentarian, which means you witnessed the German Parliament during this evolution to more foreign policy, security policy engagement, and you now serve a minister, Mrs. von der Leyen, who has an interest for the region, who has visited the Shangri-La conference, and who always says in her speeches, we need to keep the 360 degrees worldview uh, on foreign and security policy. Is this pure rhetoric? Is it enough? What does Germany do? And what should, do, what should Germany do more given what John just said on the requirements in the region? Well, in order to deliver a surprise to John Chipman, I will try to answer the question you posed to me. Um, and you are, the, you are the politician, and he's the academic. It was necessary to mention these 18 years in Parliament. But you're right. Well, first of all, of course, for a country such as Germany, this has been clearly addressed not only by Defense Minister Dr. von der Leyen, but also by our federal president Gao here in Munich. For a country such as Germany, there is no alternative to lean back and try not to be involved. So there is no alternative to this 360 degree view. And of course you're right. The 
There are many issues that would concern us enough. So, until three years ago, we would have been concerned so much with Afghanistan and the developments there, both the positive and negative developments, that we wouldn't have needed the Ukraine crisis, we wouldn't have needed the violent change of borders in Europe that we have experienced because of this aggressive Russian posture that we have to be aware of. It wasn't necessary to have Daesh in order to make clear to us that the Near and Middle East is a region of concern for us, that it is a challenge for us, and that there are threats coming from out of this region. But, I mean, it has been mentioned already. If we talk about Asia, about Southeast Asia, we talk about a region of roughly 4.5 billion people living there. So the majority of mankind situated in that region. The trade volume is gigantic and the infrastructure, the trade infrastructure is of utmost importance. So there are many reasons to have a pivot in Asia and to be aware of the importance of the reason. And there is one reason that was also mentioned. And I mean, I've just, I only had the chance to go to the Shangri-La Dialogue when my minister doesn't go there, so I had just once a chance to be there, but I learned a lot from John and many others. I mean, this is a region that is economically booming. It is a region where armament is playing an increasing role, which is not uh, surprising at first glance, because in many parts of the world, it is part of growth that uh, part of growth is invested in armament. So this is not a problem by itself, but the problem is only an important issue is the question whether the growth of wealth, the, the growth of uh, armament, uh, the military build-up, a conventional military build-up by almost all the regional states, corresponds with, an, with the construction of security regulations or institutions. And this is something I think we have to work on. There are many bilateral negotiations and agreements. There are multilateral international organizations, but as John Chipman said completely correctly, there is nothing comparable to NATO. Nothing comparable to EU common security and defense policy, I should add, in this regard. And I think it's in our common interest to have the peaceful development in the region, the, the, the increasing wealth, because um, wealth is no guarantee for a peaceful development. But uh, I mean, a wealthy country tends to be a strong country, tends to be a stable country, and what we see in many regions of the world. If you think of Russia, for example, I don't think it is Russian economic strength that poses problems to us. It's rather economic weakness. This is only one example of my other So We welcome the peaceful economic rise of China. We welcome the peaceful developments and the growing wealth of this region, but it should correspond to an institutionalization of regional security. This is, I think, in our common interest, and this is why it is necessary, not just to, to have an eye on this region, but uh, to have a strong focus on the Asian, especially the Southeast Asian region. Thank you very much, State Secretary. <coughs> Stephanie Mabst, Head of Strategic Analysis for the Strategic Secretary General, for the Secretary General and the Chairman of the Military Committee in NATO. In NATO for many, many years, if I now say my old friend, I even are deep trouble because of my long friend. Um, NATO claims to be a global security actor. NATO claims to have this global view on security policy. We have a NATO summit coming up in a couple of months or so. To my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, never in history the Asian Pacific region made it ever in the NATO summit declaration, which are the most important declarations NATO has. Does NATO enough or is it just paying lip service by saying we are the global security actor?
Number one is, I'm not sure that our partnerships with uh, a number of countries in the Asia-Pacific region never made it to the communique, but I'm absolutely sure that the countries representing here to my right, and also uh, the, the countries, um, that country that uh, was just represented by the former minister of Korea, took part in various summits, namely in our ISO meetings. So yes, they were all recognized and all played a very active and equal part in our deliberations and ultimate decisions on uh, our stabilization engagement in Afghanistan. And to this very, very point, the um, number of countries that we are talking about, Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Japan, um, Mongolia, by the way, uh, this is also part of that um, broader uh, group of what we call global partners, they are all actively engaged with us, regardless of what we are trying to do now in preparing for the Warsaw Summit. So yes, there is a very practical political recognition of our uh, partnership with these countries, point number one. Um, point number two is that we've tried very hard in the past, let's say, 10, 12 years to translate the acknowledgement that we have a lot of political challenges, security challenges in common into practical cooperation. Afghanistan was already mentioned as a case in point, but let me just point out that there are a number of individual partnership programs that we review regularly, jointly with the partners, um, and they range really from a you know, practical cooperation in the area of uh, non-proliferation, cyber defense, um, interoperability, joint exercises, anti-piracy. So the list is indeed quite long and it obviously varies very much from country to country because we would like to base our partnerships with these um, countries on the principle of self-differentiation. Number three, very quickly said, can we do better? Of course, of course. And uh, it was just a couple of uh, weeks ago that we started back at the headquarters to review, from a strategic point of view, our uh, current partnerships, trying to find out what we could do, um, offer more vis-a-vis uh, -vis our, uh, vis -vis our partners in, in the region. Um, and this is uh, an ongoing process that we are currently undertaking with both Japan, as well as with South Korea, as well as with Australia, as well as with other countries. Um, there is no blueprint, let me just make that point, for our um, menu of cooperation. It ranges a lot uh, according to the various needs of these countries, uh, but we can certainly expand our cooperation, particularly in the field of counterterrorism. I have just referred to the point that both the Foreign Minister has made, but also John Chipman and others. That's really a crucial point where we can share not only uh, best practices, where we can share information, where we can, you know, uh, yeah, exchange information, but also see what we can probably do jointly in the area of um, um, technical uh, developments, uh, counterterrorism related. So this is certainly a promising area. Um, and my three and a half point, and then I finish, is um, related to China. <laughs> because um, even though we have with the countries that I just listed, uh, formalized arrangements and formalized partnerships, we have also started to build what I would call a pretty nascent relationship to China. Um, China has, or rather the Chinese Navy, has participated in NATO-led um, maritime exercises, search and rescue, in uh, previous years. Uh, we have worked with the Chinese Navy quite successfully in terms of cooperating our counter piracy mission, Ocean Shield of Somalia, of the coast of Somalia. And the Chinese also participate for some years already in our annual conference on WMD. So that's, you know, that, that's something which it's building on, even though I'm not arguing that we should already reach out to China in terms of uh, formalizing that relationship, but we are going step by step. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Masafumi Ishii, Japanese Korea diplomat, very important post in the UK, in the US, and now it is not allowed to say NATO ambassador, but ambassador to NATO, so the Japanese representative in NATO or at NATO. 
You heard what John Shipman said about the relevance of the region. You heard what Stefan Vibrazio said on Germany's interest in the region. You heard what Stefan Bab said on NATO's uh, commitment. Um, from a Japanese point of view, what do you expect from Europe uh, or from NATO? And if I may add a second question, if we are talking about cooperation in security, what can we expect from Europe? Okay. Thank you. Uh, in short, we need more. Um, but before talking about specific areas for cooperation, since I'm the only guy from the region, let me tell you how it looks like if you see the picture from us. Okay? First, what's happening? In my mind, both China and India are rising. While number one, number two population are rising. 2.5 billion population belong to the rising country. One in three world population belongs to the rising power. No wonder we have to adopt ourselves to that kind of new situation. Not only us in Asia, but also you in Europe. It's a global change. And global power shift normally couples with the challenge to the existing rules. So you, you often talk about rule of law or how we adjust the existing rules. But these are the things we are now facing with. Now, who can be the servants? If you look around, I can identify only three pillars in the globe who are both able and willing to lead our efforts or adopt ourselves to this kind of completely new situation. United States, Europe, democracies in Asia, including Japan, Korea, and Australia, right? Then, US, Europe created NATO, US, Asian democracy created bilateral alliances. The missing link or weakest link is between Europe and the Asian democracy. No wonder if we do more, we can better cope with the changing situation. That's why we need you. This is, a, this is the picture, how it looks like from our side. Now, direct uh, answer to your question. What do we need? What can we do together? Conceptually, in my mind, there are three areas. Right? First area, share visions for common security challenges. In other words, China, Russia, and perhaps North Korea. Russia, what happened in Ukraine touches the fundamental rule. That's why we are part of the game. But in addition to that, Russia, as you know, well better than I do, is a big bear with two hands. Whatever you do in the West will have impact on the East. Right after Ukraine happened, our Air Force had to scramble almost three times per day against the Russian Army, which was doubled before Ukraine had. So, whatever you do has impact on us. China, North Korea, I don't have to tell you much about it. But before coming here, I checked the, the it's quite interesting, distance from the North Korean missile site to major capitals, right? My conclusion is, you are closer than you think to North Korea. Right? Closest capital is obviously Seoul. Next closest capital, Beijing, actually. 700 kilometers. Then Japan, 1,400. Then Moscow, 6,300. Then who comes in? London, Paris, 8,500. Then come LA, San Francisco. 9,000, 9, 9.5,000. Only after that, Washington, New York comes. It's more than 10,000. So, point is, if North Korea acquires a missile they are planning to acquire, which is supposed to have 12,000 kilometers range, whole Europe will be, will be covered. I'm not saying they are going to go much, but uh, capability-wise, you are closer to Asia than so that's why I call North Korea and China as part of the common challenge we are facing. 
Second, I'll, I'll, I'll cut short of it. Second area, act jointly for common security interests. We have already talked about anti-terrorism. You know, we, we did a lot in Afghanistan, Iran. We are part of that coalition as well. Cyber, we have participated even in the cyber exercise of NATO. Maybe missile defense. Now you know that you are closer than you think to the missile summits. But more, more, most important area where we need your cooperation is maritime security. We do share the same sea line of communication. This is exactly the common interest. We have done joint operation, anti-piracy operation already. We have heard a lot from NATO about what's happening in South China Sea, East China Sea, which we really appreciate. What we call all our intervention matters, because NATO, EU, has a high moral value. We do want to hear more from you about what's going on there. Um, I think we need to, in addition to that, be prepared for joint action, possible action for future. If you participate, uh, um, Japan is participating in a lot of NATO, NATO exercises taking place in Europe. If NATO participates more in exercises taking place in Asia, that increases our interoperability. And if you saw, show the flag, that sends some message. And maybe the last point about maritime security is I do believe Indian Ocean is a meeting point, middle ground between Europe and Asia. We can take care of the Syrian communication, perhaps uh, East China Sea, South China Sea, Maracas Strait, and perhaps Eastern part of Indian Ocean. We don't mind having a little bit of help coming from the European side when it comes to the Western side of Indian Ocean. What we should do in a peacetime is to have a joint exercise among Japan, US, India, which we are doing already, plus some of the aspirants in, uh, in Europe, or even NATO, doing exercise in the Indian Ocean is a perfectly peaceful thing, so that we can cooperate with each other at the time of crisis. Perhaps I should stop here. The last point I was going to mention is there are few common interests which we don't even realize, and my example of that is the project state issue in Africa. So I, I just stopped here. I, I stopped too. So.